That's fine. Thanks, Louis. Right. So it's a great pleasure to Talk introduce to you uh, Elaine Miller to you. Um, <coughs> we were trying to think of the best way of introducing her. Some have said that as Joe Brand is to nursing, Elaine is to physiotherapy. She's mm. a pelvic physio. She's a comedian. Book your slot now for her <laughs> show at the Edinburgh Fringe. Elaine, it's great to have you. Thank you so much for Thanks coming for to speak me, to Martin. us. And uh, we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Yes. Oh, no, 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 Thanks. Hello. It's um, lovely to be here. And you can introduce me when I'm at the O2, Martin. Um, so, yeah, I'm a physio and um, can't quite work a mic. It's just, can you open my jam jars as well? <laughs> can't manage any of that. <laughs> I'll just go in my tiptoes. <laughs> oh, thank you. That's better. There you go. Can you hear me now? Um, oh, crikey, I think we've broke it. I need a wee man that can fix things for me. Hey. Right, okay. So, um, I need to find my picture. <sighs> what I need is a wee tech guy. There we go. I think so. I think that's it there. That's me. <coughs> and do you know how I make that bigger? <laughs> so, yeah, no. Let's no. go back to the slideshow at the top here. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Hey. <laughs> now, maybe I should start again. <laughs> um, right, okay, so yeah, I'm a physio and um, I work in Edinburgh and um, my background's in sports medicine. Like um, all physios, um, we kind of go into, well not all physios, but certainly I was fairly motivated by the idea of getting to play with um, rugby players and, um, and very nice that was too. Um, <laughs> but I kind of had a change of career path um, because I had three babies in four years, um, which is what happens to you when you keep opening the second bottle of wine. And, um, <laughs> I would recommend that you don't do that. Um, <laughs> so after that, um, the science of continents and the wonders of the pelvic floor became fascinating to me. So I kind of work in, in pelvises now. And um, the, the, the frustrating bit that I have with um, work is that, you know, like you guys do all the research. You've got lots and lots of very solid research about general health care that's disseminated to the public and they ignore it completely myself included and um, and it's frustrating when you get patients coming in you think this you shouldn't even be here you should have this information and you should have dealt with this originally when you were when you were educated at the time um, and pelvic health it tends to be when women are in the first pregnancy they should get education about pelvic floors so why I get women coming in and saying oh, I've been leaking a bit since I had my baby how old's your baby now he's 45 <laughs> <laughs> like, that's, that's ridiculous. <laughs> so there's obviously a problem that the information is there, it's being given, and they're not, they're not acting up on it. Um, which is kind of like me, you know, with exercise and flossing my teeth, not quite managing it. Um, now, I had a hobby of doing stand-up comedy, and I thought maybe using humour would be a useful way of, of discussing this, because people are embarrassed to talk about continence, they're embarrassed to talk about sexual function. Um, so maybe it would be a useful tool in health promotion. So um, I landed up, um, I live in Edinburgh, like I mentioned, and I landed up writing a, a fringe show um, about pelvic floors. Again, I was, I was a bit tipsy when I had that brilliant idea. And um, the advantage of living in Edinburgh is it's really easy to think, I could do that. It's only round the corner. And nobody turns the internet off at night. So before you realise it, you've signed yourself up and you're in it. Um, and I thought that... Um, you know, it would be a bit of a challenge because, in, has anybody been to Edinburgh in the Fringe? Yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's mad. You know, there's so much goes on. There's 50,000 performances and 3,500 shows in the official brochure. And there's about the same number again of pure chancers <laughs> that are just having a wee go. So it's incredibly busy. And um, doing a lunchtime show about fannies in a basement bar, I thought, it's going to be a long and lonely August. <laughs> who's, who's going to come and see that? But um, the average fringe audience is four because there's so many shows. It's, it's really difficult to get an audience. But my average audience was 20. 
And I would like to think that that's because I'm brilliant and highly entertaining. But the, the truth is just that I had flyered all of the nurseries and playgroups and the people were desperate for this information. <laughs> but it kind of, it kind of worked. And um, if I was applying for a grant, I would say that the concept of my show is to use humour as a health promotion tool. Because if you deliver that to a socially cohesive group of people, then they're going to, um, if you make them laugh, then they're going to talk to each other. And if you make them talk, then they're going to gain empathy and that will encourage them to seek help. But really, it was just a lot of fart jokes um, that kind of got out of hand. So, <laughs> so this is me um, on the stage at Bright Club, um, which is a, now a UK-wide um, organisation. It was started at UCL um, to try and disseminate the information that the researchers were doing. So anybody that's doing any kind of research can go and do a wee comedy sketch about it. And it's absolutely brilliant. It'll be at your local university. I would go and do it because it's a hoot. Um, and it's a very effective way of, um, of communicating information to the masses. Anyway, so Maui Show um, won an award, um, which you would think would be flattering, um, but it was the weirdest show of the Fringe Award. <laughs> <laughs> which is an actual thing. <laughs> and I had to go along to this award ceremony to go, oh, thanks very much, I'm really thrilled about this. And when I left, I got passed by a zombie a cappella choir, <laughs> which is not as weird as a show about pelvic floors. And I, I think I've got a lot of work to do <laughs> with that. But because it, it got this wee award, then it kind of landed up getting a lot of press. And um, so that's kind of picked up. And last year I was away swan and abroad, thinking that I was just, you know, awfully, awfully important, which um, yeah, it was just an excuse to go away for, um, uh, to Canada and um, Australia and New Zealand, which was good because Australia invests a lot of money into continence management, so it was really good to go and meet them. Um, so this year I'm going to do the fringe again, but properly. I've reduced my clinical hours down a bit so I can free up some time for it. And there's a prize every year for the cunning stunt. <laughs> now, I said it wrong earlier on, so... <laughs> That was a moment. <laughs> kind of nervous about doing this. And it's for the, the, the worst or the most um, stupidest bit of um, ghastly health promotion that you can... Oh, I can't get it to work. What have I done? That um, somebody comes up with. Here we go. So I'm going to have flyers that fold up. This was going to be easy. What have I done? Oh, for goodness sake. Right, okay. Do you remember when you were a kid and you used to meet fortune tellers? Does anyone know how to make one? <laughs> there we go. Right, you remember these things? Right, right. So my, my, um, my, my flyers are going to fold up into one of these. You can see if you do that, it looks a weeny bit like a vulva. So, <laughs> so I'm going to get it folded up so it, it actually does look exactly like a vulva when it's printed and I'm, I'm having that prize. <laughs> It's not, it's not exactly the Fosters, but <laughs> I need to go and speak to the Fringe Society, though, because there's like obscenity laws and things, so I'm not allowed to have a photograph. <laughs> certainly, certainly not of me. Um, <laughs> anyway, so the show, quick plug of it, it's on every day at lunchtime, it's 12.40, and it's on at Woodland Creatures, which is halfway down Leith Walk, but I'm sure I'll be sending you out um, some sort of publicity from it. And you get a, um, a CPD certificate. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because <laughs> it's, it's evidence-based, isn't it? So, <laughs> so I'll give you like a list of reflective questions <laughs> and some references and you can have it in your folder. Yay! <laughs> anyway, so the reason that I'm doing it is because of this. So Sir Muir mentioned earlier on what's the incidence of incontinence and it's absolutely rife. The stats are one in three women wet themselves, um, one in nine men wet themselves, and um, for one in ten people it's not pee that they're leaking, um, equal in both sexes. I think that those stats are probably a wee bit flawed because they're taken from studies, in, um, usually in people that are already engaging in healthcare, they're usually from people already in clinics. Um, and most people, like it says in this study, they don't, they don't ever speak to anybody about this stuff. And also the way that the stats are collated are by saying to somebody, excuse me, do you wet yourself? And, and most people would just say no to that answer. That it's, I think the incidence is higher. Certainly if you talk to people at a school gate, 
talk to the women at the school gate, they all, when the child hits about five and they're starting to have bouncy castle parties, <laughs> yeah, all the women are like, no, I'm, I'm wearing my heels, <laughs> I, can't, I can't possibly go in that bouncy castle because I've got my heels on, no. <laughs> no, it's because they wet themselves, that's why. <laughs> so this study was done in Australia and, um, as I said, they fund a whole lot of stuff into, into contents management. And it's taken from 1,300 pregnant women who were being given pelvic health information. So they're engaging in um, antenatal care. And out of those, three quarters of them were wetting themselves and 2% of them were complying with information that were being given. 80% of them never sought any help for their symptoms. Part of that is because there's a misunderstanding that leaking is a normal part of pregnancy or motherhood or getting older. And um, we really need to change this because these people have got all the resources and they're still not engaging in it. Um, we need to treat the people, you know, as a as a mass. There's a horrible expression. You need to treat the donut and not the whole. Oh, yeah, physios. Anyway, now the reason that this matters is because um, if you leak in the last six weeks of your pregnancy or the first six weeks after the baby's been born, it doubles your risk of postnatal depression. Doubles it. But the midwives don't get taught this stuff, so it's not really included in antenatal classes. Although, to be fair, if a woman's engaging in antenatal classes, she's really only interested in information pertaining to how am I going to get this person out of me and then will I ever be able to sleep again? Um, they're not, start talking to them about pelvic floors at that stage in their life and they're not really, they don't have time to put themselves first. Um, the other problems that, that um, being incontinent can cause is there's an association with um, ordinary depression, like common or garden depression. 30% of people with um, incontinence are depressed because of their incontinence. Um, and there's an association with fractured neck of femur. So elderly people are rushing to the toilet at night and they slip in a puddle and they land up with a horrible injury. If you're 80 or over and you have a fractured neck of femur, 25% of them will be dead within a year. It's a huge problem. But what we do is we get that person into the healthcare system, we get a nice orthopaedic consultant to bolt them back together, physio will give them some walking aids, OT will get them some home aids, make sure that they're mobile and safe to get home, and nobody ever says to them, what were you doing up at four in the morning? Why are you up three and four times a night? And these people have all got two hips, so it's kind of like a, you know, a job creation scheme, and, and I, I think we can do better. <laughs> because unless you address what the actual cause of the injury is and the cause of the problem, they're just going to be back. And this stuff kills people. Um, same with coronary heart disease. So in Scotland, where I stay, um, coronary heart disease is responsible for one in four deaths of women. Um, now, if you wet yourself in the front row of Zumba, you don't tend to go back to Zumba. You can ask me how I know that if you like. Um, <laughs> fine now. <laughs> So diseases of inactivity are a huge problem and um, Harriet Harman was doing an investigation into this um, with a cross-parliamentary review last year, probably a year before, and um, they concluded that the reason that women don't participate in sport is because there isn't enough role models and there's not enough sport sponsorship. So we need to get more um, women's sports seen on the TV and then we'll all be running around. So I sent off an angry email going, hell no, it's because they're all wetting themselves. Like, unless you get them dry, they're not going to be out running. Mm -hmm. Anyway, she paid no attention to that very well-worded email. And, um, <laughs> and, and it's, it's important that they start to pay attention to why people start to give up um, health behaviours. Now, um, another frustration that I have with this is that this isn't new stuff. In 1998, the World Health Organisation said that incontinence was largely preventable. Um, there's lots and lots of work, there's some excellent Cochrane reviews showing that physio works. Um, if you send somebody with stress and incontinence to physio, we've got between a 70 and 80 percent success rate of a cure, not just marginally better or managing it, like completely cured so that they can drink as much wine as they like and not wet themselves, or they can go back to whatever activities it is that they're needing to do. They can sneeze with abandon and um, they'll be fine. Um, so it's a bit frustrating that from a physio point of view, that we're not better at communicating this. It's almost as if we're a bit shy. We're more effective than any medication or any surgery, so take that, medics. Anyway, um, so what the stats are saying, if there's one in three of us that wet ourselves and it's got an 80% cure rate, we're not very good at our jobs. Um, and we need to do something to, to change the way that, that we engage with the population. 
Now, as well as that, with the, the financial implications of this are massive. So this work that Australia did in 2010, and they published it in 2012, they found that incontinence costs Australia $43 billion a year, which is a lot of money. Now, even if only 30% of people that are incontinent could self-diagnose and self-manage, that's a lot of money that you, the public purse could save. Now, although this is Australian figures, there's, say there's $3 to a pound, more it changes a bit, but say there's $3 to a pound, there's also three Australians to every one person in the UK. So although this is a huge amount of money, I think it's relevant to what goes on because our societies are pretty similar. Um, in the UK, we don't calculate very much about incontinence costs. Um, in Scotland, they think it costs about £20 million every year for pads. Um, there's a figure of £248 million every year for management, which is usually pads, seen a GP, medication and surgery. Um, but we don't calculate the costs of people who are um, having to move into residential care because of continence con um, issues. Um, we just don't calculate it at all. Um, now, one of the issues that we need to sort out is compliance, because if we can get somebody self-diagnosing and then doing their exercises, they usually forget after a little while, um, and compliance is the big issue with this. We need ways of reminding people, and like Muir was saying about smartphones, you know, that's... You forget, you have somebody beeping at you going, do your exercises, that's me, um, then, and, it, and it does work. So I um, use Twitter as a training tool. When I tweet, you twitch your twinkle. Uh -huh. um, and, and I don't have, <laughs> I don't have, I like alliteration. Um, <laughs> I don't have any stats for this yet, but it does seem to, be, anecdotally, it does seem to work. I get people retweeting back saying, when I see your wee logo coming up, I remember about my pelvic floor. This figure I gave you of an 80% cure is um, if you do your pelvic floor exercises three times every day for four months. So that's a lot to remember. And it's almost impossible to do that off your own bat. There's a couple of very good apps that people can put onto their phone, but I find in clinic people do it religiously for the first three or four days and then they start to ignore the app. So um, I'm doing a clench along every day. I tweet a song that you have to <laughs> do one clench to a beat and the, the, the title of the song should be some sort of a pun to do with pelvic floors. So, you know, things like I can't get no satisfaction and anything, anything from wet, wet, wet. And, you know, it's, <laughs> it's not highbrow comedy that I do. It's <laughs> all very base. <laughs> we could try putting adverts on the babies, you know, mum, do your exercises. <laughs> and um, the exercises that I teach in the, the show aren't entirely evidence-based. The, the evidence base says you do a clench for a count of 10 and then 10 quick flicks in a row. Um, there's not a huge amount of um, work being done into what is the optimal set of exercises to do. I add in a three, uh, which is like up three floors and then back down again, just because it gives this mnemonic for people to remember. It's not a mnemonic, is it? A rhyme for people to remember. We won't pee with a 10, 10, three. And everybody who's in Contents in Edinburgh will shortly have a badge to wear that says 10, 10, three. And every time you do it, every time you see one, you have to do your exercises, that'll work. Anyway, so as far as using humour um, goes to try and address this issue, um, I quite like what Adam Hills has to say. Um, if it's funny, it's not offensive, and if it's offensive, it's not funny. Um, now, I had a good education into how thin that line can be because I was doing some, I was doing some talks to six formers in sex ed about what is normal. Um, we've got a huge problem with young people getting their sex ed education from porn and, um, you know, it's, it's not necessarily <laughs> real life love. Um, <laughs> So a lot of them are left with sort of real feelings of inadequacy because they don't realise that it's all photoshopped and scripted and lighted and they're all high on drugs. Um, so I was doing this talk to them and I mentioned the clitoris as part of the talk, as part of being a normal thing that they should know about. And the boys had all chosen to sit themselves over there and the girls had all chosen to sit themselves over there. And when I said the word clitoris, they all went, <gasps> And they were mortified. And I was really surprised because there was this visible tension in the room. And I thought, why? It's only a bit. And really, you should get to know it. Um, they weren't even breathing. So I changed what... <laughs> they, were, they were horrified. So I changed what I, the way that I did my slides and I put this slide in first. LAUGHTER 
And then I said to them about the clitoris, and it, it was fine. Nobody was embarrassed after that. I think they were so, it was a, an organ that they obviously had no idea what to do with because it was not really, as a general rule, men mentioned in porn. And so there was this tension comes up. And if you can get a laugh, then it releases the tension so you can move on with the learning. Um, so it, it, it kind of allowed me to talk about the serious stuff. Um, even Aung San Suu Kyi, she says that it's worth a laugh and crikey, she must know about it. Um, the benefits of laughing are well researched. Um, it makes you take deep breaths um, and so that helps with relaxation and trying to get oxygenation um, and it manages stress. But the mechanics of humour aren't very well understood. Some people have got a sort of intuitive knack for understanding about how humour works and um, Patch Adams is one of the notable ones of those. He's a medic in the States with a slightly unusual approach. Um, he understood that storytelling was a perfect way for communicating information about disease and about managing um, moods and, and the reaction to the burden of disease with the patients. So he used humour to give comfort and manage fear and to give hope to huge effect. Um, his work went on to develop clown doctors, so now most paediatric hospitals have got clowns that go in. These are um, people from all over the world, including my favourite down in the bottom. These are um, clowns without borders. <laughs> that cool? So they go around and they do, do work with traumatised children. And, um, you know, any child that's in hospital is having a hard time, so if they can make them laugh and forget about the ghastly situation that they're in for a while, it's got to be therapeutic. Um, they've developed in, into now having elder flowers who um, go into <coughs> nursing homes and geriatric wards um, and they're finding that they can get a real link with people with dementia, that people who are really quite locked in will still respond to a joke about swapping hats or you know, pretty slapstick humour. Um, and it's amazing what they, they managed to do. Victor Borg said the shortest distance between two people is laughter and, and I think their work is certainly showing it. But again, it's not, it's not got a lot of evidence behind it. They know it works, but it's not been researched as yet, which is the problem. So humour is entirely subjective in nature, so how are you going to measure it? What do you do? What one person finds funny, another person don't, doesn't, as my husband will explain to you. Um, <laughs> so in order to do an RCT, you need to have something that is guaranteed to make 100% of the people laugh 100% of the time. And um, that's the holy grail of humour. So if somebody manages to find that, they're unlikely to gift it to you. So you can immediately bung a whole lot of people into an MRI scanner and find out what's going on with their brain comparatively to see how humour works. Um, there is a, a woman that's been researching in UCL um, about laughter and exactly how and why we laugh. She's Professor Sophie Scott and her work's been really interesting. Um, but most of the research uses humour as a tool to compare the differences like between different populations or between sexes to see what, what people react to. And if it is about the, um, using humour itself as a, clin a clinical tool, um, it tends to examine rehearsed humour as opposed to spontaneous humour and very, very little of it looks at it from the patient's point of view. Um, there's a woman in Canada doing some work looking at the therapeutic relationship and trying to measure what clinicians do with their patients because if you're with somebody that's a skilled clinician they're able to morph themselves between somebody that comes in that's quite nervy and buttoned down and wants to have quite a you know, professional setup and somebody else that's really stressed and responds to laughter. The, the clinician's able to just adapt their approach to that person spontaneously, it would seem. We don't really understand what the mechanism is that the therapist is able to pick up from that person and, and nail it so that they're able to, to be effective with that patient. So she's trying to find out about it. Um, it would be great if we could do something to measure humour as a health promotional tool. Um, there are some very good validated quality of life measures with, um, as far as incontinence goes. So I'm hoping to do some research into it. Um, we could get an audience to fill out a quality of life assessment and um, a questionnaire to find out what the knowledge is before they come into the show and then measure it again as they leave and then compare that with six months, six weeks, six months later on to see if there's any behavioural or quality of life change. Um, now Brunel University in London has got a centre for comedy studies in there, that's a thing. Um, so most of his work has been looking at racism and humour but there's a move to try and see if we can do something with this. Um, 
Although, of course, you know, a joke is, there's a saying, a joke's like a frog. If you're going to try and dissect it, you have to kill it first. So comedians are often pretty reluctant <laughs> to have anything looked at. Um, we know that this stuff works, though, because marketing has been making a lot of money on the back of humour for years. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen this advert online, the, the, uh, the unicorn that poops rainbow ice cream. Um, it's for a product called Squatty Potty and um, it's like a stool that raises your knees up so that it makes pooing easier. The advert was very, very funny and it went viral and they, for such an awkward topic of a, of a product, they, they pitched this perfectly. It was a very successful advert. Whereas Harvey Nichols, who have got an awful lot more money at their disposal, chose to do this. Try to, to, try to contain your excitement. Go them. Yeah, they didn't, they didn't run that campaign again. Because it goes back to what Adam Hill says, there's a fine line between something being funny and something offensive. Um, now, I think this is our in, um, because a lot of the marketing people, they need our help, particularly these guys. Um, I think there's a, a, a way of collaborating with the content industry. Um, so these people make an awful lot of money and um, they don't have a clue. Um, they seem to think that this is what their market wants to do, wear white trousers and jump around a lot with insane happy faces. Yeah, it's just nonsense. Now, Tenna's profits last year was £500 million. And do you remember I said that the spend, estimated spend in the NHS is £248 million? So they're making twice the profit and mopping it up. And um, I think that they've got... <laughs> I, I think that they've got a moral obligation to put health promotion on their packaging. Um, just simple stuff like watch how much caffeine that you're drinking, um, things that are bladder irritants, things like a basic bladder diary so that people can understand that it's not normal to be up for needing um, to go for a pee more than once a night, peeing more than eight times a day is abnormal, just basic stuff. And I would give um, tax breaks to companies that put health promotion stuff on their packaging because that's the way we can access people. I did write to Procter & Gamble with um, their um, <laughs> new fancy um, contents pad, which is actually, I mean, there's nothing wrong with these things. I have a problem with them saying that this is the answer to, to the, the problem that people are experiencing, because as a temporary solution, it's fair enough. And there are going to be a percentage of people that aren't going to be helped by conservative treatment or by surgery, that they're going to need to rely on pads. And as far as being able to let people get out the house and enjoy their life, they're a good product. They, they do the job. Um, however, I wrote to them and I said, what about if you put on your pads just a wee bit of advice, like squeeze and lift? That would work. And then every time you stuck that in your gusset, you would remember to do your exercises, but they're not, they're not keen. <laughs> something, <coughs> something about the profit margins, but I'll make them. Um, the other people I think we should be collaborating with is the media. Um, the reach of the media is obviously enormous and we know that there's a spike in referrals to GPs after um, Women's Hour mentions anything at all to do with continents or pelvic floors. And I've just realised I'm wearing exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> I have a somewhat limited wardrobe. <laughs> So this is how we, we should be reaching people. Um, Mumsnet's a, a um, parenting website. It's one of these things that people just put their own content on. And um, their reach is enormous. So I've done a couple of guest blogs for them and also for the excellent Evidently Cochrane, which has got a massive and ever-increasing reach. Um, the other thing that we need, to, other people that we need to collaborate with are each other. I don't think that we're very good at, like physios I'm talking about, we're not great at getting out of our department and speaking to other, um, other colleagues. Um, we should have a system where, say, fit, fitness professionals in gyms that are doing exercise classes, these baby boot camps and things like that, if they have somebody that's got a symptom, they should be referring them to us. And if we can't help that person, we should be referring them on to the surgeons. There should be quite a clear flow chart of um, collaborating between so that we can get people the, the appropriate help that they need. Um, putting information in the back of public toilets doors about do your exercises, are you here again? Um, you don't need to put up with it, go and get some help. And um, adult shops as well, adult retailers land up with an awful lot of people looking for help because of their conscience or because of their sexual dysfunctions. And when I was in Australia at a conference, I nearly emigrated because I got off the plane and the, the woman that was organising the conference came and swept me up and took me to a sex shop. <laughs> I was like, good grief, you don't get this in Edinburgh. Um, 
But the reason was because the woman that ran the shop was doing some fantastic outreach where she was teaching um, urologists and urogynecologists about how to talk about these difficult issues because she was getting lots of people coming in, asking her for help. She was, she's not a clinician, but the communication about it and, you know, a sort of ABC about what's available to buy online. I had quite an education in Australia. Anyway, <laughs> so... This bit of work, um, the Vagina Monologues, is 20 years old this year. I know, it makes you feel like a grown-up. Um, I've seen it and it's quite an angry bit of work, um, but it's certainly the last thing that's been done in the arts about women's health in general. There's not really been much that's had the same kind of impact of um, women's health and well-being in 20 years, which is a bit depressing. <coughs> the idea of a vagina monologue is all very well, but I think that having a vulva dialogue would be better, um, that we need to get people talking about this. Being incontinent is more common than having the cold. So why should people be ashamed? You know, it's a treatable condition, so we should be encouraging people to not put up with it. So this show that I'm doing is kind of evidence-based, or at the very least, it's evidence-laced. And um, you'll come and you'll get your CPD certificate. And um, <laughs> I think if you do a review, then it definitely does count as reflective practice, hint, hint. Um, and I'm hoping, to <laughs> I'm hoping to get enough of an audience so that I can start to gather some stats. Um, I'm not a researcher, not yet, but I'll do like an initial foray into people that come to see it and um, see if there's any merit in trying to do a bit more work. Um, so Woodland Creatures, Leith Walk, every lunchtime from the 5th to the 28th of August. And um, you're all going to come, aren't you? <laughs> I'm needy. <laughs> um, so feel free to get in touch with me. Um, these are my contact details to, um, you know, talk pish or fannies. Um, <laughs> um, it's, it's the only way, collaborating is the only way to try and disseminate the amazing work that's going on and Cochrane's certainly at the forefront of that. Um, there's some bits that I would quite like to change. Um, obviously you guys can only do reviews of the research that is being done and that's entirely limited by what funding's available and what people are choosing to research. At the moment the Cochrane guidelines are for um, teaching pelvic health, uh, pelvic exercises, that women should be taught that in our first pregnancy which is fine for the women who have a first pregnancy or engage in antenatal classes, but for the women who don't have children or the men who have pelvic floors, they just are missed out with this education. And then um, for the guys, usually it's older men that have problems with their continence because their prostate's a tricky little tyke sometimes. Um, but when you look at things like erectile dysfunction, there's some evidence that doing pelvic floor exercises is, is more effective than taking Viagra, but Pfizer don't want you to know that. And um, doing your pelvic floor exercises can cure premature ejaculation in three months. So, you know, guys usually are kind of interested in that and I'm quite enjoying this moment where, <laughs> where they're all looking at me going, really? <laughs> <laughs> you gonna tell me how? <laughs> I will, in August, come to the show. Um, <laughs> but at the moment, there isn't really a care pathway to, to sort of educate people who don't engage in antenatal services with pelvic health at all. Um, and the other thing that I have a problem with is the um, prolapse um, evidence says that women who have got symptomatic vaginal prolapse should be referred on to surgery. So the ones who don't have any symptoms, which is the vast majority, we don't do anything for them. They'll go for the smear and it's observed that they've got a prolapse and we don't teach them to not become constipated at any time, not ever, no, it's not good for you, to avoid heavy lifting and just to, how to look after the thing. There is very strong evidence that if conservative management can um, prevent prolapse from progressing. And there's some that's been done in Aberdeen that looks like if you're doing pelvic floor exercises, um, it can prevent it from happening in the first place. But at the moment, there's not enough evidence in order to do a Cochrane review. So um, clinically, sometimes we're changing our practice when there isn't a Cochrane review and then you get into this grey area where, you know, the physios hate me because I keep going, no, I'm not doing that, I'm doing that. Anyway, so we'll get there. Um, so thank you for listening. If you have any questions, then I'll give it a shot. <laughs>
very much. Um, with another hat, I'm the convener of Friends of the Meadows and Broxley Links. <laughs> and you may know that our real problem at the moment is lack of toilets. Yes. So if we can somehow get together and bring humour into the campaign to get some more toilets. Yeah. Brilliant. yeah, yeah, you're right. There's there's been a there's a nurse in Jersey that's been looking at the toilet provision over the whole of the UK and how they're they're all vanishing and what an impact that has on people that have got some element of heart disease or I'm um, sorry, heart failure or conscience problems. And it makes people housebound. And especially people in wheelchairs. Yeah, yeah. There is an app that you can get that it's called Map My Toilet, and um, it'll tell you within the sort of 20-minute area where your nearest toilets are, um, in in shops and in coffee houses as well as public toilets. Map My Toilet. Anybody else? Yes, right at the there is something I learned when I was looking after my grandmother, who lived at age 102, which is that the NHS doesn't fund uh, incontinence products. Mm. And I think that if the older population knew that they were going to have to pay for this themselves, yeah. they might be more likely to, uh, to learn yeah. about how they could help themselves. Yeah. And I wonder if that's uh, an opportunity that we can yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You're right. They have to have significant leakage before they can get it funded on the NHS. And what they get are pads that are, are the size of bricks. That they're not, you know, they're not very comfortable. There are a lot of really good products available in the supermarket shelves. But if you're buying these things yourself, then it's going to cost. If you use four a day, then it costs about twelve hundred pounds a year, which is a lot of money for many, many people. Um, now there was a study done in Montreal where they looked at the elderly frail in residential homes and what impact giving them one-to-one -one physio did and they got 80% of them dry in six months and it was a thing that continued on, um, you know, it had lasting effects. The problem is trying to get a population that you can work with because these were people who were cognitively really intact and motivated. Um, but the Care Commission, the Quality Care Commission in Scotland, has just finished a bit of work looking at trying to promote continence in um, residential places and trying to educate the staff about, you know, double padding isn't a good thing, that actually getting people up and walking them to the toilet, apart from maintaining their dignity and getting them <coughs> mobile, actually is, is so much better for them and they're in finding that people with dementia and behavioural problems, their behaviour improves, that there seems to be, oops, seems to be some impact on their, their um, perception of their own dignity is what the thinking is. So there's lots and lots of help available for that at the moment. Um, it's trying to access a lot of the time for that generation talking about these things is just anathema. They, they're not keen on it at all. Um, but if we can get people now, if we taught kids in school about what pelvic floor exercises are and about how it will enhance their sex life, because generally speaking, you know, young people are kind of ra randy wee devils, and um, so they might they might pay attention to it. And if they did, then perhaps we wouldn't have a situation where 50% of women over the age of 50 have prolapses. So, yeah, you're right, that, that it would be great to target these older people and pads for them, they're just, they're not acceptable. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks very much, Elaine. Thanks. Not at all, thank you. Uh, Elaine, are, are, you, are you joining us for dinner? Oh, yes, I so, am, uh, yes. So, uh, Elaine will be, people have questions they can ask you. Yes, Good, yes, I much. do like Good. to talk Excellent. about it. Good. 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 Thanks very much. No, thank you, Mark. Uh,